All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for showing up. Tonight is Baddies in Tech Try Hack Me Night, where we are going to go over the network security room. Um, I do want to let you all know that I'm recording the screen just as a VOD for people that are not able to attend. However, it's not anyone's voices. It's just my voice. So if you do watch the VOD and if, you know, I'm talking to people that are in the chat with us, then it's going to sound like a one-sided conversation, but don't worry. I'm not talking to myself. <laughs> Maybe I'm talking to other people. Um, so, and the, for the people here in discord, in the chat, you don't have to worry. Your voice is not captured. Um, it's just the screen with my voice. All right. So network security. Um, oh, and also I wanted to say that you, I, I'll ask questions, but you know, you don't have to answer. Um, it's not awkward for me or anything like that. If you know, no, no one chimes in and answers. Cause you know, it's, these kind of situations are a little awkward, especially when you're new to it. So don't feel pressured to like chime in or answer or, you know, just respond to me. I'm totally okay with it. So uh, we're going to start with the network security room. Um, for network security, uh, what comes to mind when y'all hear those two words together, network and security? I think of securing the networks, which I think sometimes can kind of be very vague because sometimes you think does network security encompass like securing the, you know, like the servers or is it like accounts or is it networks? And we're going to find out today <laughs> on today's episode of Dragon Ball Z. All right. So a computer network is a group of computers and devices connected with each other. Network security focuses on protecting the security of these devices and the links connecting them. In more precise terms, network security refers to the, to the devices, technologies, and processes to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability, avail, availability of a computer network and the data on it. So, if you uh, in some of the previous ones, we we went over the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity and availability and how that interacts with cybersecurity. And so network security is over encompassing all of those things It's trying to ensure that they're all uh, secured. I hate defining a word with the word, but I think that worked there. Network security consists of different hardware and software solutions to achieve the set security goal. Hardware solutions refer to devices you set up in your network to protect your network security. They are, they are hardware, so you can literally hold them. A hardware appliance looks, a hardware appliance looks something like the image below. So this, Looks like it would be a rack, I'm guessing, with something. <laughs> and these are your computers and I guess it's doing the security. <laughs> I don't I don't not I'm not sure. I mean I kinda understand what the picture is, but like my brain keeps going back to servers on racks. But I mean the hardware appliance would also be on a rack too. So so examples of hardware appliances include a firewall appliance, intrusion prevention, intrusion detection, and virtual private networks. Um, does anyone know the differences between like intrusion, intrusion detection and intrusion prevention? IPS and IDS, those are like two very popular um, ways that they kind of segment the ideology of network security. So, and of course, firewall, I believe we all kind of know about the firewall or maybe we've interacted with it at some point in our careers. So it says here that the firewall appliance, the, oh, 
I'm making up words. Firewall appliance. The firewall allows and blocks connections based on a predefined set of rules. It restricts and can it restricts what can enter and what can leave a network. Intrusion detection, also known as IDS appliance, and intrusion detection detects systems and network intrusion and intrusion attempts. It tries to detect attackers' attempts to break into your network. Intrusion prevention appliance, IPS, and IPS blocks detected intrusions and in intrusion attempts. It aims to prevent attackers from breaking into your network. Virtual private network, concent virtual private network concentrator appliance, VPN. A VPN ensures that the network traffic cannot be read nor altered by a third party. It protects the confidentiality or secrecy and integrity of data sent. So the biggest difference between intrusion detection and intrusion prevention IDS and IPS is you can always think when you hear intrusion detection, just think it's not doing anything actively. All it's really doing is detecting it and letting you know. So it's alerting you like, hey, someone's trying to, I don't know, break into this account or there's some suspicious network activity going on over here or this person's account. They got they logged in from outside of the U.S. in a, you know, blocked um, from a blocked country and intrusion prevention can actually stop that from happening. That's the biggest difference between the two. And so here we have a device. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what this device would be. I mean, it has a management port, a console access. I'm get, I mean, I guess it could be a firewall. It could really be any network device just based on the picture. On the other hand, we have software security solutions. Common examples are antivirus software, host firewall, and host firewall. So I would say these are the ones that we users are probably the most familiar with. I'm a gamer, so I definitely have to finagle the firewall sometimes when I play a new game. It's asking me, like, do you want to allow this game through the public firewall or the private firewall? And Obviously, I want to only allow it through my private firewall, but, you know, we've all seen this screen right here at some point troubleshooting some kind of network. And if you haven't, you definitely will. Uh, this is a very. Um, this screen is uh, has a lot of things to it and a lot of places you can go to configure various different um levels of security on the device itself. So antivirus software, you install an antivirus on your computer or smartphone to detect malicious files and block them from executing. And host firewall, which is unlike the firewall appliance, a hardware device, a host-based firewall is a program that ships as part of your system, or it is a program that installs that you install on your system. For instance, Microsoft Windows includes Windows Defender Firewall and Mac OS includes an application firewall. Both are host firewalls, which makes sense. When you think about it, it is on the host. It lives on the host. It resides. It comes with the host. And your host is your endpoint, your device, your computer, your server, whether that's Windows or Mac, stuff like that. Let's see, according to the cost of a data breach report in 2021 by IBM Security, a data breach in 2021 costs a company 4.2 million per incident on average in comparison to 3.86 I'm sorry, 3.86 million in 2020. The average cost changes with the sector and the country. For example, the average cost for a data breach was 9.23 million for the healthcare sector, 
while 3.79 million for the education sector. Does anyone know, like, does anyone have any ideas as to why they would be such a huge difference between the averages for something like healthcare and education? Like healthcare being at 9.23 million average versus education. I'd probably say maybe it's because the healthcare sector, they have more information. They have more important information. Whereas the education sector, they may not have the exact data that someone could use to maybe extort you or try to scam you. Whereas the healthcare sector, they've got a lot <laughs> about you, um, a lot more about you. And they might have more data that's a little more important to you as a person. So this is the IBM cost of a data breach hits record high during the pandemic. I will add this to the uh, chat for people to review afterwards. It looks like it's a solid read. Huh. Okay. They say AI adoption of AI hybrid cloud and zero trust approach, lower data breach costs. It's very interesting. This is from 2021 though, or that's what it looks like, which is still great information. So what type of firewall is windows defender? Any guesses? The host based firewall or host firewall. Let's see. Submit. Hooray, we got it. <laughs> so that was just a little review of like a little introduction of network security. And so now we're going to go over to methodology. So every operation requires some form of planning to achieve success. If you are interested in wildlife photography, you cannot just grab a camera and head to the jungle unless you don't care about the outcome. <laughs> For a safe and successful wildlife photography tour, you would need to learn more about the animals you want to shoot with your camera. This includes the habits of the animals and the dangers to avoid. The same would apply to a military operation target military operation against a target or breaking into a target network. So we kind of have our, um, our journey here. Recon, weaponization, delivery, exploitation, installation, control and command, action on objectives. The recon stage is the first one. And it makes a lot of sense. Recon, you definitely have to, you got to do your research. You can't just break into a an institution or attack a target. That's the word we use here, target. Or even just go out and start taking pictures of birds. If you don't know anything about the birds, <laughs> you need to do some research. Let's see. Breaking into a target network usually includes a number of steps. According to Lockheed Martin, the cyber kill chain has seven steps. I've seen this a lot more, the cyber kill chain, the seven uh, steps in the cyber kill chain and like what happens at each. So I will post this here in the chat as well for you all. So recon, weaponization, the same ones we have above, delivery, exploitation, installation, Command and control, C2, and actions on objectives. So recon, short for reconnaissance, refers to the step where the attacker tries to learn as much as possible about the target. Information such as types of servers, operating systems, IP addresses, name of users, and email addresses can help attacker success. Um, the recon stage what do y'all think 
how do y'all think they get this information? Do they just kind of like, I mean, clearly the hacker or the ransomware actor, they're not contacting the company and saying, hey, can I get a list of email addresses? Where do you think they're getting this information from? They're definitely getting it from, I would say, social engineering, or they're getting it from data, um, data breaches. Uh, you know, if you have an exposed server of some sort to the internet, they can definitely use some like Shodan to find that as well. Weaponization. This step refers to preparing a file with a malicious component. For example, to provide the attackers with remote access. That makes a lot of sense. That's a logical step. Once you figure it out, once you figure out the information, then you get ready so you can maintain your access, get the access. Delivery means delivering the weaponized file to the target via any feasible method, such as email or USB flash memory. This one is interesting as well because with email, that's that's why we're so, you know, we talk a lot about phishing and social engineering attempts and things of that nature because, you know, you might get an email that looks legitimate from Microsoft saying you need to pass, you need to reset your password. It's always a sense of urgency in some way, even though there's never really a sense of urgency with some things, right? Like you're already logged in. You're not getting told by anyone, but this email saying that you need to reset your password right now. It's, it's mandatory and USB flash drives, which is why, you know, they say, don't just pick up a flash drive in the parking lot and plug it in. Uh, but also attackers try to do that. Like if there's a business and they've got some exposed USB ports, it's a great way to be able to deliver the file. Exploitation. When the user opens the malicious file, their system executes the malicious component. Installation. The previous step should install the malware on the target system. Command and control C2. The successful installation of the malware provides the attacker with a command and control ability over the target system and actions on objectives. After gaining control over one target system, the attacker has achieved their objectives. One example objective is data exfiltration, stealing the target's data. It seems like most of the recent hacks that have gone on, data is the most important thing that they want. Um, I'm not a threat actor or a security researcher, so I couldn't really say why, although I have an idea because data is money and data can be used to extort and harass and all these other things. Um, but if you notice the hackers lately, they've always stolen information they didn't just, they, they're not just hacking in and encrypting all the files and saying, ah, you owe us money or not you owe us money. Um, we're going to extort you for 20 million or something like that. Oh, okay. Here's our hacker and this is our house. And you can see our hacker is just watching our house. <laughs> Another analogy would be a thief interested in a target house. The thief will spend some time learning about the target house, who lives there, when they leave, and when they return home. The thief will determine whether they have security cameras or an alarm system. Once information has been gathered, the thief will plan the best entrance strategy. Physical theft and execution. Oh, physical theft planning and execution resemble in a way a malicious attack that aims to break into a company and steal data. The next task we will carry out a practical example of the cyber kill chain. Yeah, that may, I mean, it makes sense. Um, cyber 
uh, ransomware actors and cyber uh, criminals. I guess that's the perfect word. They are cyber criminals. Uh, they they definitely plan and they execute a cyber crime against a company or whatever it is. During each step of the cyber kill chain, does the oh, during which step of the cyber kill chain does the attacker gather information about the target? Oops. Does anyone have any idea? It's definitely recon. That's the first step. That's where we um, we get the information. Recon is just like a lot of research, a lot of, you know, figuring out what's out there, figuring out how we can get in, stuff like that. Okay, now we have our practical example. I will go ahead and start the machine. Start our little attack box here. It does take a couple of minutes before it just launches up. Let's see what we have to do here. We will try to hack into a Linux system in this task. We assume that you have never used a Linux system before and we will explain accordingly. Start the attack box. Okay, so once the attack box is started, then we will bring up the Command line, the CLI. Let's see, what do they have us doing here? All right, so we're running an in-map scan against a specific IP. This is our target IP and we'll scan it by running this command. Has anyone used nmap before to scan um, networks? Uh, I would not say use go out and into the world and start using nmap because hacking is illegal. It's a crime, but they have platforms like try hack me or if you create your own lab, you can run nmap to scan IP addresses. And you can also um, like in CTFs, they'll give you like a, a like kind of like a statement of work on the domains and IPs you can target and the domains and IPs they do not want you to target. And so that's you know, they usually segment it pretty well. I feel like I went through this last time. Hello, box. It's supposed to like just pop up. But it did say a minute or two, so maybe I'm being impatient. Oh, maybe this is the machine being provisioned right here. T2 nanos. <laughs> I hope it's actually... go I probably didn't read the screen I think that's what happened <laughs> I didn't even read the instructions or maybe I did I don't know okay so now our attack box is finally loading
Yeah, I definitely hit the wrong button the first time. <laughs> All right, so we finally got our attack box up and running. Uh, we won't read any of that, which, yeah, maybe I should, but it's okay. It's <laughs> it'll be totally fine. We'll just we'll just go with it. So let me make this a little larger here, because I also cannot see. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're gonna start here. The first step of our attack is recon. We can speed up our recon activities using different tools to gather information about various aspects related to the target. For simplicity, we will use a single tool for in this task, Nmap, short for Network Mapper. Nmap is a network scanner that helps us discover running machines and any programs running on them that are visible to the outside world. The IP address of the target is 10.10.189.234. We will scan it by running this command right here. Let's see if we could just paste it. Okay, that worked. Perfect. And now we're running our Nmap scan. That was very quick. <laughs> Okay, that was very quick. So we can see from our Nmap scan here. So you can kind of read the Nmap scan. Uh, this is the report. Um, this is telling us, uh, I just know this because I work with this, but it's an EC2 instance in US, US, EU West 1, and that's the DNS. Let's see. It has... Some ports in map return to us. Port 21, FTP, port 22, SSH, and port 80, HTTP. So that's good. We got, um, and so we got the same thing. Uh, FTP server stands for File Transfer Protocol, and it is used to transfer files between machines. SSH stands for secure shell and it is used for secure remote login. In other words, it allows you to execute commands on a remote system securely. And HTTP stands for hypertext transfer protocol and it is used for the web. Whenever you are browsing the web, you are using HTTP or HTTPS. HTTPS is the secure encrypted version of HTTP. You'll also notice that Nmap reports on whether the host is up based on whether it receives any response for it. This is useful to know when no ports are open or accessible. So right here, we can see that it says Nmap done, one IP address, one host up, scanned in 1.78 seconds. All right, so now we're going to try to connect to the, FT to the FTP server to the target FTP server. So we'll just enter the command FTP. I could have just copied that because I know copy paste works. So we'll do that. FTP paste. Make sure there's no spaces. Okay. And so our name we're going to use is anonymous. That's the name we're gonna log in with. Make sure there's no spaces. Oops. Oh yeah, this is a remote session. So some of these work. Oh, I just keep hitting the wrong keys. Don't worry, guys. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> okay. So 
We will try to see the files available using the ls command, short for list. We get a list of available file names along with their details. So let's go ahead and type ls. So now we're still on our attack box, but we are using the FTP protocol to look at our target. So we're we're on the attack box, but we're looking at our target. Can I make this? I guess I do have to make this smaller. Zoom out just to make it look better. It still doesn't look great. Okay, here we go. So we can see all of these directories. Well, I mean, all of these files here. We got some random files. We got backup. SH, we got some text files. So it looks like a book. I think EPUB is a book extension. We got secrets.txt. That looks kind of good. If you're curious of about any file, you can download it using get file name. I wonder what the secret text contains. And so let's download secret.txt using get. So let's do get secret. Dot tx, txt and boom we got it and let's also download i want to download one of these random ones just to see what's in them two six eight zero dash zero dot txt failed to open file did i type the wrong thing two uh yeah, I just made up all those numbers. 26. Okay, perfect. So now we can type exit or buy. So we'll type we'll type exit instead of buy cuz exit is kind of more um neutral. All right. So now we know that we downloaded secret and we downloaded this one 2580. And so Oh, here they are. They talked about it. Okay. Looking at the files, we notice there are six of them. Three text files, two EPUB files, and one SH file. The first two extensions are text files and ebooks, while SH is extension indicating a shell script. A shell script usually contains a group of commands that need to be performed repetitively. After we download the secret text file with the FTP command and exit it using the client exit, using the command exit, we return to the terminal. Let's display the contents of the secret file. So, okay, perfect. We see secret right there. Let's do cat on 26. Cat is concatenate. And all it does is just show you the information. This is long and some, some license information. So let's go cat on secret. It looks like we got a password. That's a pretty big deal. So now we might be able to SSH into our target using this password right here. They stored their password in plain text on the file server under a, are you sure you want to continue? And so now we're going to connect. Oh, we're going to connect with our password here, which is paste, enter, boom, we're in. This is how we know we're in because it says welcome and it says it's a, an Ubuntu zero users logged in. Like we know that we're in now um, into the target. So let's see what else do they want us to do here? Congratulations. You have now complete control over the target. Let's collect a couple of flags. After logging in as root, we use the following command, pwd, which is print working directory. 
which were in the root directory. Then we're going to ls to see what files are here. And we have a flag.txt. So we're going to concatenate on our flag.txt. And our flag here is try hack me FTP server owned. That's to answer the second question. What is the password? The second question. Okay. So we'll go through those. All right. So now they want us to, uh, because we're logged in as root, we have full access to all files, including other users files. Let's try this out. We executed the following commands. So we CD to the home directory, change directory to home. And then we did LS on home and we see we have librarian, FTP secure, Stratigos, and we notice librarian is one of the users on the system. However, we have a system administrator root privileges to check the contents of this home folder. So now we're going to CD, which is change directory into the librarian's um, directory, the librarian directory and PWD print working directory to confirm we're at home slash librarian. This is, this would be similar to if you're in windows and you know how you can go to like this PC and users, and then you can see all those different users. If you're like on a server or something, this would be the same process except you're in command line. This would be like no different than doing that. So we're in the librarian's home, the librarian home directory. And now let's LS to see what's there. We have another flag. So let's concatenate on our flag again. And then we have try hack me librarian account compromise. And we got it. So let's to summarize what we did in this task to get root access on a target system of 10.10.189.235. We use nmap to learn of the services running. We used FTP, we connected to the FTP server to learn more about its configuration. We discovered a file containing the root password mistakenly copied to a public folder. We used the password we found allowing us to log in successfully and then we gain access to all user files and, and history. That's, that's pretty much <laughs> at that point. So let's grab our flags here. This was the password to the secret text file. This was the flag for the root directory. And this was the flag for the librarian account or the yeah librarian user oh it says my answer is wrong oh oh i didn't copy copy did i just not paste the right thing okay and there we go we got it <laughs> so that was pretty much an intro to network security Next week, we'll get into digital forensics, which is going to be super cool. I like forensics, but that was network security. Um, I thought that was a really good little introduction, ex especially because when you think about the steps that we took, we definitely went through the cyber kill chain. We definitely hit on multiple steps of the cyber kill chain to be able to get to the our end goal, which was either well, for here, it's root and librarian user, but, you know, as a threat actor, they might like their goal is definitely root. They want to get root or domain admin or maybe the highest level of access that they can. So, yeah, um, does anyone have any questions, comments about the session tonight? Oh, did my headset go off? Hello? Yeah, my headset totally went off. That's crazy. 
Mm-hmm. Mistake. Um, so I don't like to, a lot of people in security tend to think that um, folks that like when there's a password in a public folder or in an Excel sheet, they say it's incompetence. Honestly, you know, I think a lot of people just genuinely make mistakes. Like maybe they meant to put it somewhere else and they didn't or something like that. So it's definitely um, user error. So the system admin or someone put that in a text file, which is discouraged. We never put passwords in unprotected text files. And then they just stored it on the public directory instead of like a private directory, which, you know, at that point, it kind of it's the it's negligible as to the impact. But, yeah, it I I would I would say a mistake because I have a lot of empathy <laughs> for people working in these types of roles. Mm hmm. Okay. Anything, anyone else have anything else? All right. Well, that is going to conclude tonight's uh, lesson. Um, next week, we will work on digital forensics. Thank you all for showing up. It was a pleasure. Y'all have a great rest of your night. Later. You too. Bye-bye.